Hey everybody, welcome back to our stream. I am Davis Pang, also known as Pang's Picks on Twitter, writer for Fantasy Six Pack and Stochastic. And with me today is the ever so hope, oh, dope, hope, and <laughs> owner of the channel. And then on the bottom, as you can see, we have the myth buster, the ship chaser, the ADP chaser, Sam Sherman. How are you doing today, Sam? I'm great. Yeah, uh, excited. Uh, when I saw the message that you guys are going to be talking about my charts, uh, I, I was excited you guys were interested in it. So, um, yeah, happy to to hop on and and talk through that. But yeah, how are how are both of you guys doing? I'm good. Um, like I said, when I saw those charts, it flooded all of like best ballers. Like everybody was like sharing to each other, tagging us in it. Like, do you see this? You know, and we had to. Like, we were, we knew immediately. Like, we wanted to talk about this because it's something that we've talked about without real math. So. Once again, thank you for putting that out there, you know, busting a bunch of myths. And um, yeah, other than that, like I got nothing else for it. Uh, you guys can catch, you know, Sam Sherman on his ADP chase team on Fridays at 1 p.m. Eastern time. It's some of the greatest stuff that I've ever seen. And like, the hope has put me onto this. And I actually just watched your guys' the last show, the veterans uh, climbing up the red, veteran running backs climbing up the board. So like, I'm just happy to have you guys on finally. And then. We can put up the chart and we can go over it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Let's get into it, Sam. I know you had some points you wanted to get into. You've seen some, you know, discourse around the charts you released and some things you agree and disagree with. So, um, yeah, let's start taking a look at the charts and, and, you know, what your opinion is on that stuff. That sounds good. Yeah. So, um, at at a high level, uh, like maybe before we can have these charts up before, like we we dive into into these charts specifically, I kind of want to talk through why, why I took this approach to research. Cause I think what you'll often see in, um, best ball research, particularly on underdog, you have people looking at advance rates from the last couple of years. And I think that's totally valid. Um, that's valuable data. We should look at it. Um, we do have to keep in mind that it's just three years of data. And then if you zoom in even further and look at like, semifinals advance rates and finals advance rates those are heavily biased right by just like two weeks per season like the semifinals advance rate is just what happened basically in in week 15 like to get from week 15 to 16. the finals advance rate is basically just what happened in week 16 get from weeks 16 to 17. so when you see like that type of analysis out there it's like okay i i i understand like we should be looking at this but it's really just like a few weeks of data so I kind of wanted to zoom out further and look at the past 10 years of data and really try to get a sense of like position level volatility uh, across quarter quarterback, running back, wide receiver and tight end. So this is all across like a nine year sample. This is 172 weeks rather than just looking at advanced rates, which again are heavily biased by just like two or three weeks per year over the last couple of years. So that's like high level, like, macro lens like why i kind of took that approach um right. so i want to level set with that does that like make, make sense to you guys or any any further questions about like why sort of why we would do that no that makes a ton of sense and uh, actually we were discussing backstage before you know you came on uh, it's like i was you know like if you look at pat's team that won it was what how many points 160 something for it but now it's like in week 15 you know there was numerous teams of 190 something points you know like Someone would have argued mm. weeks ago, well, you got to score 200 points to like win finals. It's like, no, you don't. Like you, you just, got, you know, it's not how that works. Just that one specific week had, it doesn't mean that that's going to occur week 17. Um, and I know that yeah. when I was in the puppy one finals, like the number one person had like 195 points. And I was just like, you know, like it's, it's, you know, I'm glad that you brought that out that says, Hey, it's not those grand scheme of points. It's not based on that one week or that other week. It's, literally what is and i would say the overall average of that right i always say that you need 120 points per week to basically get out of round one but then 120 is the average but that could be 100 points one week and then the other week could be 175 right you're just averaging 120 so yeah i'm not sure if that's how you took it yeah no that that's totally right like yeah there's there's weird things that happen there's certain down weeks i mean we see this in dfs right that like um, you know, certain weeks you need a huge score to make a tournament, certain weeks, all the chalk fails, a bunch of low scoring games, maybe bad weather across the U S and, you know, you need lower points to, to score. So, um, yeah, I think that makes sense. So 
anyways, I guess like getting into this chart now, I guess we can go through like the the different uh, myths. Um, I kind of like did yeah. this provocative way to, to get reaction. So I think the first myth that this chart is showing, um, you'll often hear that, okay, wide receivers, it's a more volatile position. There's way more spike weeks at wide receiver than there are at running back. Um, that's, it's just, if you look, so again, looking at the past 10 years of data, I'm just looking at scoring data. Um, the number of spike weeks across these different thresholds is actually very similar at running back and wide receiver, particularly once you get into like the bigger spike weeks, what I call the major and mega spike weeks. So this is 17.5 points over replacement, uh, 25 points over replacement. These are like the, the 25 plus point games, 35 plus point games and half PPR. Um, there's actually equal number of those at running back and wide receiver. So that, that was the sort of like the first myth I wanted to dispel because it makes intuitive sense. Like, I don't know. I always thought this to be true. I definitely said this, like it intuitively, it makes more sense. Like, Oh, wide receiver. Um, you know, it's a little more volatile. It's not just getting the ball handed to you in your pocket. It's like quarterbacks throwing deep passes, you know, MVS can get two catches for a hundred yards and two touchdowns on the Packers or whatever. It, it's like more volatile. Um, but if you look at the data, it's just uh, it's not it's not true. Um, so that that's you know, we talk about blown coverage, right? Like blown coverage plays for wide receiver occur way more often than blown coverage on running back. It's not like the other eleven guys on the field just go, oh, let let them go, right? It has to be some kind of an amazing play for running back versus a wide receiver. Just the the safety fell down. <laughs> you know, Gabe Davis, the his DB fell down, and he gets two touchdowns and 120 yards. It it makes sense, right? Like. Yeah, it's not as it's prettier than a running back having to break a 15 tackles and so on and so forth. So that makes yeah. a ton of sense. And I, I mean, the map shows it's seven games of spike weeks, another eight for wide receivers. It's really not as much as we thought. And then for major spike weeks, they're literally holding hands two and four, right. zero point four. So yeah, and I think what you have to consider here too is like um, – the, the number of players drafted at each position factors in here too. Like if you look at the chart on the left, yes, there's more wide receivers, but like, yeah, and, and we can get into this data now. Like once you account for the number of players actually drafted on average. Um, so here I basically just took those, those numbers uh, on the previous slide and then divided them by the number of players um, that were drafted on, on average an underdog so there's like 60 ish uh running backs drafted in every draft closer to like 90 to 100 wide receivers drafted in every draft so once you take that into account like each running back pick you're making actually has a higher chance of a spike week than each individual wide receiver pick you're making um and and i've dug into like uh, like you, you could maybe argue in this chart that hey like you're not accounting for players that don't go on draft that go completely undrafted and that factors in as well um i've actually been digging into that more to see how much of an effect that would have and it changes things like slightly but it doesn't change the overall story which is essentially that like your percentage chance of getting a spike week when you draft a running back or draft a wide receiver is like basically the same like it's it's not statistically different like maybe slightly better for running backs but it's like it's not true that wide receivers just give you more spike weeks or a higher percent chance of a spike week than running backs, like end of story. Um, so, so a big thing that I like to talk about is like contribution weeks, right? And I think we actually, we were talking about that one time, we relate this back to Pat's team. It's what was his contribution for his flex? I hope it was like 11 points. Yeah, it was some, I believe it was something low. I know that he had a score from Taekwon that counted. Um, yeah, right. It's, like, it's 11 points for your flex, right? Like a contribution week is 60 yards and a touchdown or 50 yards and a touchdown. Uh, a running back that gets 17 touches for basically no yardage and falls into the goal line, right? Like when we look at those numbers, it's about contributions and then you go minor, major, and mega spike weeks. There's a lot of running backs who contribute by just falling in the end zone. We see it with Malcolm Brown or Jordan Howard in the past and and I know some people are going to point to the undrafted receivers, like you said, but like, you know, if Richie James and Isaiah Hodgins skew this heavily, then I think we've been drafted wrong so incorrectly for, you know, decades now. So I, you know, I, like I said, I, yeah. when I look at Pat's team, we're talking about that. I was like, it's all about contribution and running backs, as this shows, is they get replacement spikes, but 
they contribute more because they have to do less half the time and you can predict a lot of their usage right i could predict that someone's going to get 12 to 15 touches but i can't predict that a receiver gets 10 targets at least that's how i kind of interpret that part of that too or at least how the points are made up yeah i think that makes sense and that's also getting into like there's a whole other discussion here on like uh redraft first first best ball and i do think that uh one of the reasons i think zero rb is more powerful in redraft is exactly that dynamic you, you mentioned uh davis where if a running back gets injured, their backup, it's very like projectable that they're going to be worth the start and you'll probably get them into your starting lineup when they have the spike week, you know, sort of the, the lower end running back um, spike week. But the wide receiver spike week is much more unpredictable on a week to week basis. Like, um, you know, Darius Slayton catching a deep touchdown for the Giants last year and getting in your lineup like You'll, you'll get those points in best ball. You probably won't get those points in redraft because you're not going to be able to predict when like Darius Slayton is going to go off, uh, yeah. if that makes sense. So the, the, the whole dynamic, like you got to think about predictability uh, on a week-to-week basis. That's more important for redraft uh, versus predictability on a season-long basis. Uh, that's sort of more important for, for best ball. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that, that's sort of a whole whole other side discussion, I think. And of course, that's just a theory about why we draft handcuffs and, or we draft somebody else's handcuff. It's like, well, if that guy gets hurt, I steal his value. We're not going to go all that. But I mean, I, I like some these charts are amazing. And that's that was just my interpretation on it because I always talk about like, how, you know, the flex portion. And you said it, my receiver hits rates are a little bit more. We draft way more receivers and they don't hit that often, right? I, you know, I pick 190. That wide receiver might give you one to three spike weeks or even contribution games. I don't even say spikes. I would take contribution games. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Think, and, and, um, go ahead, Hope. Yep. I think one of, well, I was going to kind of transition to something a little different. Um, I think the difference and kind of, I saw this in some of the threads you had on Twitter, um, but the difference between full and half PPR and how many people are so used to full PPR, because I think I was one of those people who made that mistake last year. And I'm so used to like playing DFS on DraftKings, you know, and all these GPPs playing a receiver in the flex. And I think a lot of people brought that mentality over to underdog, or at least mm-hmm. I think I made that mistake. And then so we're thinking, oh, you know, add all these receivers. Um, because they, they, yeah, they get the, they crush in the flex and stuff like that. So I thought that was an interesting aspect to, you know, not enough people factoring in the half PPR. Yeah, 100%. I, I think that was sort of like, my thesis when I started this research is that people, I mean, what really started this research is just the, the first two rounds on our talk right now are insane where people are drafting like the wide receiver 16 before the running back six. They're drafting like the wide receiver 30 something before the running back 14, which is Najee Harris or, you know, stuff like that, that I'm just ah, like, see? whoa, whoa, whoa. Najee Trufer. There we go. <laughs> I, I, to be clear, not, not a Najee Trufer necessarily. Um, but like, Aww. that's me. I like that fifty percent of them. So like, I I, I think RB fourteen like Najee is just wild in comparison to some of the receivers and other guys. Yeah. No, I, I I don't think he's a bad. I don't think he's a bad value. Um, yeah. but anyways, like, um, we could we could talk Najee too. But uh, like, that's what inspired the research is just like this underdog ADP. It's it's crazy. Like, especially in the early rounds, how wide receivers are being prioritized like so heavily over the running backs. Like. I thought something was a little out of whack. So that inspired the research. I, I do want to say like, and we can go through some of the other charts. Like um, this was not intended. This thread was not intended to be like, this means you should go robust RB in every draft or like you don't need wide receivers in your draft. Um, that's like not what these numbers are, are show. Like you can't just look at these charts and say like, okay, running backs are better than wide receivers. Let's go for running back to start my draft and ignore the wide receiver position. Like wide receiver is still very important. You need more of them than you do running backs. Like, I don't know. I have my research that, you know, running backs and wide receivers each hit the flex like about half the time, roughly. So you can think of it as like, you need two and a half running backs. You need three and a half wide receivers. Well, that still means you need one more wide receiver than you need running backs in your starting lineup each week. So like the quantity of wide receivers are really important. It's also important. Like you need to take wide receivers uh, early enough to get, to get ceiling from them as well. So I, I'm definitely not saying like, and I think some people maybe misinterpreted as like, 
I think like you should go robust RB, like RB, RB, RB in every single draft. Like that, that's not (laughs) exactly what I'm saying. I just think that like, if I were to say which position is undervalued in the market right now, I think running backs, particularly like the, the RB ones that are going like in mid late round three, like, I think, I think people have it a little backwards by letting the, those guys uh, fall so much. Um, so yeah, the, yeah, hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. It's like, it's nuanced and um, you know, I, I've been doing this research like I just started it this this past weekend and I'm planning to write an article and sort of dig into this a lot more. So like, I will yeah, say so that like, that. this is like- That first yeah. chart up hope, because I think that's what he's referencing to a little bit. The first chart, no, left of it. Do I? No, no, the, the first, first chart. I think the, yeah, the flex one. This one. Yeah. So that's yeah. what you're referencing towards, right? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, we can talk through this one. So uh, I think this was maybe like myth one in my thread that was- my favorite one, Flag. by the way. This is my favorite chart. If you didn't know, like this, I love this chart actually because yeah. it, it no, showed ahead. Ahead. the numbers of times these guys hit, and it even represented tight end, which I think is very underrated in a flex position. Yeah. Um, so this this one I think is really interesting because um, this is what I like always always said. Always hear people say, "Hey, in in underdog, the flex is a fourth wide receiver position." You should treat it as that wide receivers score more than running backs. They're going to hit the flex more than running backs. Um, that That's not quite true. I, I will say, um, and I, we don't have this chart right here. I did make the like undrafted quote unquote adjustment to this chart. Meaning like some of these players in here, uh, particularly the tight ends. Uh, these are guys like, I don't know, um, Durham Smythe who catches one, you know, one catch for right. 25 yards and a touchdown in a week gets gets nine points or whatever and, and hits the flex. He's never being drafted. Like there, there, there are undrafted players in in these bars, right? That we should account for somehow because like what we actually mm-hmm. want to capture is you know the percentage of players that hit the flex out of like the regularly drafted player pool, not just every single player in the NFL, because that's like slightly misleading. So I did make the adjustment of like taking out players that were undrafted over the past couple of years and it changes things slightly. Um, I, I would say it's more like 45% wide receiver, 45% running back, 10 ish percent tight end. So again, like I think it still is like the same high level takeaway that running backs hit the flex, like roughly half the time wide receivers hit it roughly half the time. And then there's like a little bit 10 ish percent for tight end, um, which again, I think is like, it doesn't say running backs are better than wide receivers. That's like not the point. It's just saying that, hey, like the the flex like is a position that's hit by running backs just as often as wide receivers. And that's not what you hear people say in half PPR. People are always saying, hey, the flex is a fourth wide receiver position. You got to treat it as that. Uh, it, it's just not there's there's no way that that that's true um, based based on these numbers. So. Um, I saw one of the arguments online that was like, well, you can't use 2013 to 2022 data. It's different than, and, and I was like, well, if you go up to just the last five years, you're saying minimally about 60% of the time, it's not a wide receiver. Right. Cause I, and I think that the yeah. tight end portion, I think I overlooked a lot on this. Cause I always talk about like how important it is to have, if you do take Kelsey or these elite guys that have maybe like a slightly mid tier guy at the bottom kind of fits how often these tight ends hit flex. So yep. it's not just, well, the running back's hitting it just as much or more often. It's, well, this is how often wide receivers not doing it, which is about 40%, of, you know, 60% of the time, they are not your flex. That's a yep. big chunk to really think about, which is way different than what we've been told the last, what, three years of best ball. So mm-hmm. That's how I interpreted the chart. And I thought when you posted not only just those two, you posted the tight ends, like that just really changes that number up. Yeah. And, and one other thing I'll add is like, um, this chart like doesn't prove that you shouldn't draft like your fourth wide receiver before your second running back. Like that, that can still be a viable strategy. And I think like, particularly if you take like one running back early or maybe do something like two running backs, and then hammer like five wide receivers in a row before your third running back. Like, I think those are sharp and like good strategies. So it's maybe a little counterintuitive that like it, it could be optimal to draft as if you think like your your fourth your flex is a 
wide receiver position, meaning like you want to go heavier and wide receiver early rather than like loading up on like four running backs before you take your third wide receiver or something like that, like both, both things could be true. And it, I think it's kind of like nuanced and, and complicated. Right. Um, the point of this chart is just to show that like, even if you go maybe like two running backs early and then take running back in like 10th, 11th, 12th or something like that. And you took six wide receivers before then, like, even if that's a good strategy, like on these teams, those running backs you're taking later are still like hitting the flex just as much as those wide receivers you, you took earlier. So, um, yeah, I, I don't want to like confuse people too much. Cause I think like you can, you can over interpret some of these charts one way or the other. Like, I, I guess my main point is just that, um, you can win in the flex at the running back or the wide receiver and people shouldn't be treating it as like strictly as like, ah, if you're like trying to win at flex in the running back, then you're wrong. Or like, that's not how scoring works like that. That's just not, not quite true. Yeah. No, I think I... the, uh, I think the roster allocation part is a big part of this too. I feel like a lot of times, especially like last year and in previous years, you know, you, you see people taking nine, even 10 wide receivers, I think that's where you get into issues with thinking too heavily that the wide receiver has to be in the flex and then you neglect your RB position thinking that it just doesn't matter as much, you know, cause you're going to put a wide receiver in the flex and that can just make your team a lot weaker overall. Yeah. And I know we talk about wide receiver and one of those things I think that gets, like I said, missed is that we draft more receivers because they tend to miss more often. Right. It's, three starting receivers and then your fourth is whatever position fills. But if I took only eight receivers, I have, and then I assume that that flex was always a receiver, then my receivers have on average have to hit 50% of the time. And there's not that many receivers that hit 50% of their games as relevancy, right? I mean, even Justin Jefferson missed five of his 17 games as, you know, under 10 points. So that's how I would look at it. And that's how I used to view it. I viewed it as that. I was like, well, I take more receivers. I need, my wide receiver three to be a bit more consistent. I need my flex to be totally more consistent versus I need my four wide receiver, my eight wide receivers to hit every other week. Cause the odds of that are slim. I can't think of many receivers that do, you know, out of 16 games provide eight upside games. Hmm. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. That makes but, sense. And I think, yeah, but I agree with both what you guys said. Um, yeah, I think the, your point, Hope, it's like we, we always like the concept is very familiar to us. Like if we take two running backs early that like we can put on the brakes at running back and, you know, just take a couple late and we it's like the anchor running back strategy. But I think that concept is not applied as well to wide receiver, where if you take four wide receivers in your first five picks, I think I think that's fine. Totally viable, like even probably like a pretty good, good strategy, if you, especially if you get the right guys. Um, but then just finish with like seven wide receivers. Like don't it, right. like you, you gotta, you gotta draft like you're right in, in either situation. And I see people like realizing that at running back and not realizing that at wide receiver where, you know, you take your 40 first five picks as wide receiver. Like if those guys fail, your team failed. Like you can't just keep tacking on eighth, ninth. I mean, maybe eight is okay, but ninth, 10th wide receiver, like that's just over allocation of draft capital to to a single position when you really you need balanced draft capital across the positions um, to to have upside at, at all of them. I know. Yeah. Last year, I think I was a, a big corporate of that where I, if I took an early RB or two early RBs, I would skip right over Miles Sanders and Josh Jacobs every time. Right. And then take those guys later, tack on like three essential handcuffs if I started with two RBs and then missing out on that mid tier of RB that are going to be in starting roles. I think that's, that's something I did last year a lot and that I'm trying to not do as much this year. Yep. Totally makes sense. Uh, do you guys want to chat through the, the, uh, the final chart, which was the, sure. the spike week? This one? Yeah. Or was it? Yeah. I think this one. Okay. Um, so yeah, just uh, to go back to the thread again, uh, I think this was myth myth three in the thread, which was um, okay. Like maybe maybe running backs and wide receivers have the same number of spike weeks, but um, early 
early wide receivers are like the key to best ball because um, you'll get all the major spike weeks out of like the early wide receivers. Whereas it's really easy to find, you know, sort of late round running backs that, that smash and give you spike weeks. What the data actually show and, and like, Reading these charts is complicated, but so like what I kind of want people to, to look at here, to take the major spike um, middle section of this chart, for for example. Uh, if you look at running back ones by preseason ADP historically, they have accounted for 46% of the spike weeks at running back, whereas wide receiver ones have only accounted for 40% of the spike weeks at wide receiver. So essentially, the market is better um, it, Maybe that's a confusing way to phrase it, but RB ones historically um, account for a higher share of the position spike weeks than wide receiver ones account for the total share of wide receiver spike weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if you're looking at that same chart and you go up to you know wide receiver five and sixes, um, you actually see more spike weeks from the late round wide receivers than you do from the late round running back. So I think it's like common perception that. Oh, these late round wide receivers are dust. There's trash. You're not going to get upside out of these guys. Whereas, oh, these late round running backs, they can be, you know, handcuffs that get you upside weeks. Um, and, and that is true. But like when you look at the data, it, it's actually true that late round wide receivers uh, give you a slightly higher uh, chance at a spike week compared to late round running backs. So I think that that is sort of a common. Um, yeah, that's very common. Con- contrary yeah. to the narrative out there like you everyone it says yeah just you know end your drafts with like four rbs type thing like if you start with two early um yeah so, yeah i think that that's very interesting to see um when i saw this when we were talking about this earlier too it's like i, I like to relate it to players that are on teams or players i can relate it to right you know we joked about like isaiah hodgins and slayton already but like Corey davis kendrick Bourne, guys that were technically like the threes coming into the into the season that we're about the KJ Osborne, you know, these type of guys that are falling out of that, that are on rosters in situations that have prime games, Zay Jones, you know, DPJ, like a lot of those guys were super relevant. Um, and they had mega spike weeks. I mean, I got carried through because of um, Zay Jones and KJ Osborne. Um, and those guys were really late in the drafts versus, you know, RB three of a team. And here's the top of it off. Not every RB is a direct handcuff. We get that wrong a lot. You know, when did, you know, uh, Derek Henry got hurt. All of a sudden, Adrian Peterson came out of nowhere. Deontay Foreman came out of nowhere. So it's hard to get direct handcuff ideas for running backs. I think wide receivers are talking about injuries and et cetera. It's a little bit more easier to get to because that roster is already there. Yeah. I think the handcuff thing is a great point that, like, I think it, it sounds so nice in theory that it's like, oh, you know, I drafted Hassan Haskins. If Derek Henry goes down, it's this big contingent upside play. Um, you know, the, the examples of those guys that are big contingent upside plays that definitely do exist. Like we saw, you know, Samaj P. Ryan last year, Alexander Madison historically, yeah. you know, Latavius Murray when he's backing up Alvin Kamara in New Orleans. Like those guys exist. I'm not denying those guys don't exist. Um, the thing is, they're just not as common as as people think. And so many times, like the RB2 that's supposed to go into the starting role either doesn't end up being the starter or it becomes like a full on committee and he doesn't have as much upside as you think. So I think people talk about a lot. Oh, like the NFL, it's going away from the workhorse running back. It's going way more to committee backs. Well, I think another implication of that is like when the starting running back on a team gets hurt, teams are not going to use the backup as a workhorse as like as often as they used to. You know, it, it makes sense that the team, if NFL is moving away from workhorse running backs and more to committees that, like the contingent values guys are going to be more like impacted by committees of the RB3 and the RB4 behind them as well. So that that's where I'm careful. Like I'm a little hesitant of, you know, people trying to say, oh, the NFL is different now. Um, you know, they're the workhorse era of the workhorse running back is, is dead. Well, like, what does that actually mean? Does does that mean that like running backs are, are less valuable? Or does that actually mean that like the running backs that are workhorses are even more valuable because they're more rare? Um, and like these backup situations of guys falling into 25 touches a game just because they're, you know, the, the RB2 on the depth chart, like is probably less common. So um, yeah, that, that's getting more into narrative street, but uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. 
and like I said, we don't mean to crap on there. If that's not what the whole point of this chart was, this was just kind of like, hey, once again, you're myth busting, you're telling us what the numbers are. You know, there's more value to some of these guys. So we really appreciate these charts. Um, and yeah. I know, like, like I said, the whole best ball community kind of just started sharing this like wildfire and became a huge topic. You became more popular than like Lamar Jackson for us. Right? Mm -hmm. The Lamar Jackson topic was out the window <laughs> when I saw this come up. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, um, I, <laughs> I'm just saying. For me, it was. I was. I was talking about waiting this way more than I talked about anything it, in free agency in the last two, three weeks. So it it um, really blew up, and it, it's consumed a lot of the past couple of days of people messaging me. And you know, <laughs> it, I'm glad we get to talk about it. I'll definitely. I will say that I'll definitely have more. Um, if you're like really like that thread and and like this discussion, I would say this is just like. Um, a small piece of like the overall research I'm doing into this space. And like, I would think of it as like part one of like a several part series. So um, yeah, if, if you like this content, there will be more of it on the way. We'll be addressing like people's pushback, like people saying, Oh, what happens if you just look at underdog data the past couple of years? Like, you know, historical data is irrelevant. What happens if you just look at, you know, underdog ADP? Um, what happens if, you know, you take out the undrafted players, like all that sort of pushback, um, I'll, I'll be addressing and, and diving into with more charts. So, um, I'm not sort of quite ready to, to share all of that, that sure. here, but yeah, just wanted to say that like, this is, this isn't the final word on this data and, and there will be more. So, um, excited to, to share that and, uh, hope, hope it gets as <laughs> good a reaction, uh, as the first thread. I mean, it has 50 bookmarks, Sam. You should be proud. You have 50 bookmarks on it. I looked at it. I was like, this has so many bookmarks. People are going to be referencing <laughs> back to this. You're going to help create a champion based on that chart. I, I guarantee it at some point you're going to help create a champion. So I know your time is limited and um, we thank you for stopping by. I mean, are you working on anything else that you want to talk about? I know you're, like I said, reference one more time, ADB chasing at 1 PM at Friday on, you know, 1 PM Eastern time on Fridays, but is there anything else that you want to promote before you go? Um, no, just, yeah, just that ADP chasing Fridays. Um, I will be hopping on, uh, Leone's Establish the Edge pod next week to to discuss uh, this research research as well. So awesome. be on the lookout for that. But um, yeah, other than that, um, thanks a lot, guys, for for having me on. This was this was fun, and uh, good luck <laughs> good luck with this draft. I hope uh, hope you guys yeah. can uh, take down the big board here with with awesome. the help of uh, this uh, running back propaganda. <laughs> All right, <laughs> appreciate it, fun. Sam. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. You have a good one, Sam. We really do. But yeah. I appreciate it. I'll see you on Twitter. Um, and you can whip us again at BBM. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good, guys. See ya. See ya. That was right, awesome. Guys, once again, that was Sam F. Sham Sherman. You can follow him on there, Sam Sherman underscore FFB. He's really good. Like this guy had three finalists in the Best Ball Manias, and I'm sure he killed it in every other at at retrospect and catch the stuff. If you haven't seen that chart, you know, DM us. Look on it online. You'll fight it. Um, I mean, what was your takes on that hope? Like, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I thought some, we brought some interesting stuff that you hadn't considered. Like, I like, you know, that kind of pushback of this isn't a RB propaganda chart, right? It, it kind of seemed like that when you first initially saw it. But that's not what this is. You know, it's just about knowing that, you know, different positions can get in the flex. Like, there's this huge narrative that it's got to be wide receivers, it's got to be wide receivers. But that's just not true. And roster allocation, that's a big one for me. And like I said, I made that mistake last year. Always, you know, almost always going nine wide receivers, eight or nine. But, you know, it's okay to stop at seven, even six. Like if you start five, six wide receivers in a row, you know, play like you're right. I think that's a huge, huge thing to do um, that a lot of people don't. I mean, um, you know, let's put up the draft soon and we can talk about one last thing on there. I know Hayden actually talked, had a great chart last year about like – when does the dim diminishing return appear? And, and the diminishing return is basically like when you stop gaining real value on something. When you talk about wide receivers, like the minute you got to wide receiver eight, the diminishing return just just got there. Like, and and people were like, we well, gotta get nine and ten receivers. Like, well, the math showed that like after eight, you were kind of just just digging up, you know, maybe one usable game. Um, and this is also what led me to my last year's article. If you that I'll, last year's thread. That led to this year's article about like why three tight end is so important. 
Oh God, we're at the back. <laughs> oh, it is. But three tight end is something I talked about quite a bit. I did release an article on this recently. Um, you can catch it on fantasypack.net. It's just you know how we punt tight end. How, why does it matter? And the diminishing return on those positions. It's a big deal. Yeah. And we always say this at best ball has not been figured out. Nobody's figured out best ball yet. It's a very volatile sport. Well, fantasy sport. And the ADPs are not always correct. You know, I took a lot of Josh Jacobs last year and I tried to convince hope. She told me I was dumb. I'm just kidding. No, but it's like one of those things we just don't have ADPs correctly every year. And we draft off of consensus. We just play around it. You know, right. if I can get Josh Jacobs at round seven, I'm not going to, just because I believe he's an RB2, I'm not going to grab him at round one. I'm not doing that. It's, right. We play around ADP. So do your own rankings is one of the things I talk about quite a bit too. Um, and, you know, once again, shout out to Sam for, com- Sam for coming on. Uh, he definitely was like. Yeah, you guys, if anyone is not watching ADP Chasing, you're definitely missing out. It's on the Ship Chasing channel. Um, I feel smarter after every time I watch it. Um, it's a lot of the same stuff, kind of like he talked about with us, and he's just going to keep expanding on it as the summer goes. So, yeah, definitely watch ADP Chasing. It's probably uh, my favorite show out there right now. Um, can you put up Tarek's comment? I actually like this comment. So Yeah, absolutely. Liam, you know. But BBM2 champion, I always address them correctly, said the same thing regarding acting as if you are right when you draft a lot of wide receivers. And and I agree. Like, And I talked about this on one of our drafts. It's If you're taking these guys early, then you believe they're going to be good. The more you take against them, it's you having less confidence in something, right? If you're adding to it, you're just saying that, oh, I don't believe this guy's really going to do what I think he's going to do. So then why are we investing such high capital in it? And so, and obviously there's more game theory to this. Um, yeah. Hope any thoughts on that? Yeah, I totally agree. It's something I'm doing better job of this year is is limiting myself. If like you said, I like drafting a lot of wide receivers, but if I draft five or six in a row, like well, not stop at five, but if I draft if I draft five or six in a row, maybe add one or two more, and then you know draft like you're right. You know you still need running backs. You still they can easily fill the flex position, and so that's something I'm trying to do to do better this year. I mean. We keep saying running backs, but we also need quarterbacks. You need your tight ends. Like every year is a little bit different. And this year, like quarterbacks are a premium. Quarterback 19, and we're like done because, you know, in the years past, you used to have Big Ben, you used to have Jared Goff, you used to have Derek Carr at like quarterback 26. Now it's only about 19 viable QBs. So, yeah, I think that after the draft, when we have, you know, landing spots for these rookies and we have a few more of the, free agent dominoes to fall. Um, I think that'll make some of the later QBs a little bit more relative because relevant because you get no, okay, stacking partners. And so if you're making bets on players earlier, um, you'll know what quarterbacks to stack with. So I think that'll help make a few more quarterbacks a little bit more relative, but yeah, no, they, they don't come close to touching the top guys. And that's what's so tough about this QB ADP is, it's tough you guys really can separate. Um, We're coming up. Let's see what we got on board. Yeah, yeah. let's take a look. All right. Uh, so we're faced with the, with the running backs here. Um, I, I'm totally fine double tapping RB here. I, I like all three of these guys. I probably prefer Eckler Bijan. Um, yeah, that's fine. I would probably prefer Bijan Barkley. Um, I, I still want to, but I think Eckler has been a, is going to stay as a chief at the, uh, sorry, as a charger. So let's just grab him. Hey, look, we got second round Eckler. Doesn't that make you feel better? Yes, feels like I like Eckler. I mean, I am nothing against him. Uh, I got, I got him in the third once, and I was just like, "What am I doing in this? Do I stop? Is this my three RB team?" You got him to fall to the third. Wow. I got him to fall like to like pick twenty three once or something like that, and I ended up getting him, Henry, and like and Justin Jefferson or something. And I was like, "Well, I guess I I win." But well, <laughs> I just I just think I win. I'm now. not as confident in Derrick Henry as you are, but. That's a good team. You just hate the these like up the gut guys, all right? Just no, I players. am just worried this Titans team could be a disaster. But you know what? I need to keep that open mind. I said the same thing about the Seahawks last year. I thought, that Josh team, Jacobs. I thought that <laughs> was gonna be a disaster. Well, we're not paying second round prices for Josh Jacobs last year, so it's a, it's a little different. Um, but yeah, once their QB situation is more settled, and look, there's still a chance he gets traded. I was listening to one podcast um this week and they were talking about the Kaplan implications and to them, like it doesn't make sense for Tennessee to keep him. Um, so we'll see there. Um, I'm surprised. Three. So this can kind of get us into the Lamar situation a little bit. Um, 
I they were also discussing Lamar and like why the Titans aren't making a bigger effort right now because and this was kind of more narrative-y, um, but they're opening a new stadium. I don't know if you know that. The Titans are going to open a new stadium in, in a couple years, I believe. And, like, we've seen this kind of with the Rams kind of making all these flashy moves when they moved into SoFi and stuff. Like, having a franchise quarterback when you, you know, are opening this brand-new stadium and all the excitement. And I know that's stuff that in a fantasy, like, player we don't really care about, but – wouldn't it be cool if you're this owner opening his brand new stadium, if you have Lamar Jackson there as your franchise quarterback? Like, it would make sense to me, but apparently there there's some cap implications for them as well that, that make it tough. But I just think they're a team that, that needs a spark. Like, they just seem to be going nowhere. And who knows, maybe they'll tank and they'll get Caleb and and that'll be that. But I mean, you got to put butt in seats, right? Like, we, yeah. we always talk about, like, oh, well, what does it do for fans? I mean, this will be realistic football season a business so putting butts in seats is like always priority right nobody wants to sell their tickets for nine dollars this isn't like the 20 you know 2005 warriors you know you want to put butts in seats and in order to do that you got to sell tickets and you got to have people to show up i know that when i i bought tickets to go watch my dolphins a couple uh like you know last year and the minute Tua got hurt i was contemplating like man Tua's hurt i have to get return my ticket like i i do not want to go down there and see my backup versus whatever right like and it was oh, painful so i mean i totally get that i ended up um i was planning to go to a mavericks game coming up but i ended up s- selling the tickets because the team is just like awful right now and they're not a fun team to watch. It's not enjoyable. So that that's a different sport, you know, not what we're talking about. But I think it's the, kind of the same thing. And then, like, the Commanders are another team that, you know, were rumored to maybe have some interest. Like, they're another one. If they're about to sell, like, wouldn't a new ownership group love to come into a team with a franchise quarterback? Now, obviously, cool. and, you know, they might not want to come into a fully guaranteed contract for their quarterback. I mean, but at the same no. time, like. It makes so well, much so we got to think about beyond why they're not signing them. We we know that that the tender that they got wasn't a franchise tag. It's like a non-tender tag, or whatever it would be. So it's basically like a big kind of like a cock block tag, which I thought is actually super smart because it's a tag we don't see a lot, especially for quarterbacks or you know very prized possession, uh, prized players. But the way the Ravens have set it up has just been one giant like you know kind of like, do you want to waste your time? You know, it's like any trade in fantasy sports and redraft. Like when someone says to me, hey, um. This is you want him like you send me an like you know I heard you wanted my players or I want one of your players can you tell me who you want for mine it's like no like give me an offer and I think they took that off the table right now so I think that's part of why I think Lamar is not really moving but if he does I cannot think of a, any team that is worse receiver wise than the Ravens right now the Ravens have like the worst receiving core I think it, it, we shit on everybody else Nelson but. Aguilar doesn't get you excited. I mean, Super Bowl champion Nelson Aguilar, okay? Put, put some, put some respect I've had to watch Nelson man. Aguilar on my favorite team the last couple of years. And so, no, he does not get does not get anyone excited. Um, <laughs> I think he had one good play the entire entire last he did. year. <laughs> one good play. <laughs> it's literally one play. I remember someone pulled the highlight. It yeah, I think he, he scored a one bomb touchdown like against the Steelers, maybe. All, All right. right. This is tough. Um, ETN, Najee Harris. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> We're talking well, about Al- Alex had Derek Henry at 30, you know, 32. He could have gotten back to us. It's perfect. I would have made him our second click and got him in the fourth round to make myself feel better. Um, I think we need to look at receiver here. I mean, obviously I love Ramondre, but we started our BRB. I don't know. We could, we could start hyper fragile and do Ramondre. I want to go with, like, I want to get a receiver. I think I want to lean on Ridley. Um, you know, he's promised us 1400 <laughs> yards. A solid bounce back. I think he gets like eleven hundred, but like that's good. Um, any receiver you want here? This I is a tough this. range for me. Um, we do a I lot of. We can, we can grab Ramondre here and then really just get weird with it. Yeah, I'm fine doing that actually. Yeah, because if I say Harris threes, again, you're gonna hit me. So I can't. Yeah, say I mean, Najee. we're not taking Najee Harris when Ramondre is on the board. Um, that's like not happening. I just uh-huh. this receiving part is really tough. You get DJ Moore, you get like luckily when Michael we joined Jamin. this room, there was only one spot available. And so hopefully we don't have a lot of wide receiver drafters in here. Um, like mine and Chris's draft had. But yeah, right there. I mean, I just don't love that tier wide receiver as much. Um Mike Williams is just I don't know. He we do have Eckler. 
we could have stacked him up and then got Herbert, had the Herbert Eckler. Mike, I wouldn't have minded that. Um, but there's still, a, I like a lot of these receivers, and we should, when it comes back around, be able to get like at least one more of them. And then I still like, I like these guys too. So I think there'll be a couple good receivers for us at the next turn. You know, and it's always a good reminder that like you don't have to like certain rounds, you know, certain, you don't also have to abide by certain rounds. You can reach. You know, we talk about like every pick is well, if you go five picks. We're just jamming our bees. It's you know, everyone talks about like grabbing somebody eight eighty piece later as a reach. But realistically, if you're on side to side, like you should be able to grab twelve to twenty pick eighty piece later because you need to build the roster you want to build. That that is true. That's something on the turn. Like I do not mind reaching as much because you know there's just no chance some of these players come back to you. Yeah. So that's when I mean, I like not overreaching and things like that in drafts, but sometimes you kind of just have to, especially this early when so much is going to change. Um, I mean, I last year I was grabbing like pick six, pick five Saquon because I knew that he would never get back to me at pick 17 at, at some point. Originally he was, but towards like the summer ending, like I was never getting Saquon. And I was like, I'll just get Saquon. I know I'm going to get Tyreek Hill back because nobody took Tyreek. So I would just a little build Saquon Tyreek combos. The entire way through, and and you know it, it paid out because there's just some guys you don't like, and that's okay. You know, like yeah, you don't absolutely. have to take everybody. Eight percent is nice, but if no, just I have plenty of guys, so I have zero or one percent of like. I'm a balanced exposure person, but that doesn't mean balance every single player in the entire pool at eight percent. Um, yeah. We have not. to assume like some of these guys are going to take it, so feel free to like reach out 10, 15 picks away. Yeah, absolutely, and like I think we basically have to double tap receiver though. Um, oh, yeah. God, I was in that draft that yesterday that like which irked me. I had the guy who took 13 quarterbacks, and I'm just like, I should pay attention to my draft core <laughs> because I wasn't paying attention. I watched 13 QBs go. So I wish that would get thrown out quickly. Um, I hope so. That's but, one thing like I've noticed sometimes I feel like it takes a while for drafts to get thrown out. So hopefully that's something they take a look at. Um, I, honestly, I think they shouldn't throw it out. I think they should have kept it because it's one of those things that it's a one off. But if people know those things are thrown off, I heard from last year that's why people started doing it. They hated being like a certain pick. Oh, I, I have doing. definitely some seen people get um, their pick sniped through like at, in like the sixth round and then just take quarterbacks the rest of the way. I, I literally saw that a couple times last year. So they knew that the draft would get thrown out. Um, but I don't know, 13 quarterbacks like that has. I feel like that just can't. I got. I mean, I would want my bullet back, honestly. Like you yeah, know, that's true. That that's my opinion on I, it. I have Derek Carr and Bryce Young. They're gonna take me all the way, so I, I think I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, I would want my bullet back instead of. Uh, look at Najee going uh, mid fifth. This is a pretty wide receiver heavy room, I will say. I don't know see, if we're gonna love the wide receivers. Najee, yeah, I would be totally fine with taking that. And look at these receivers just fly off the board. We're gonna. You know, this might. I don't know. This might be a nine wide receiver team at this point. So I want to bust some myths. I did finish my underrated article for at least the players of this draft. Uh, three positions each, two positions each. I would say check it out. I wrote a big piece about Najee Harris and Jalen Warren. Um, I'll tweet it out later. But I, I still, I'm still on them. I know people are gonna give me crap for still taking some Najee up to this point. Stephanie said even she considered Najee mid fifth. <laughs> She didn't pull the trigger. All right, yeah. we got to take a couple of these receivers. I want Evans. I think well, Evans. Did you is like, want Evans? I heard. I, was, love I was listening to one pod today, and they had a lot of. They had him as one of their biggest losers of free agency. But I'll take really? him. Well, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Um, I know you're into our... Burks. I would consider Burks here or Pickens. Ayuk. I like Ayuk. You know, I like I like Ayuk a good bit. I think I'm a little scared of Ayuk just because yeah. of Purdy. What about Marquise Brown? I'm not taking much of him at all, but I'm not taking any of Marquise Brown. I, I would rather I'd rather take right, anybody well, else. Let's go trail on then. All right. I'll yeah, watch the, some uh, the Mike Evans skepticism um, it was actually from Evan Silva on on one of established runs pod. Just the the age cliff for him, and then they believe Baker's a huge huge downgrade for for him. Um, and I mean I agree. I think Baker's terrible, and the fact yeah. that Chris Godwin hasn't been traded yet as well. Um, just that they think that team is just going to be terrible and not be able to have a, a very much functioning offense. And so now things could change in the off season. If, if Godwin got traded or even Evans. Um, yeah, exactly. So, okay. So I like that, but I do think that it's a little off 
because Baker is someone that used to test a lot of things. He tests his like coverage, which was what's I think favors guys like Evans, right? Like I and I always compare this between the two quarterbacks that we had as Dolphins, Ryan Fitzpatrick and, and Tua. Tua will always take that, you know, he's that veteran mindset of like, I'm just gonna take the guy that's open. I'm only gonna take the free like gimmies. Ryan Fitzpatrick, the reason Devontae Parker had such an amazing year is because like Ryan Fitzpatrick had no problem testing 50-50. He had no problems throwing to coverage. He didn't care if he got picked off. And I think as much as, as that's bad for Baker, I think that suits Evans a lot because I feel like he's got to make a splash, right? And, and someone's going to say, well, that didn't happen. I'm like, well, it did. Van Jefferson and Tutu Atwell had these like, and Benny Scow have these like really ugly deep shots thrown to them. Right. And, and I think if anyone is as, can take a 50-50 ball, it's going to be Mike Evans. Yeah, and no, I, Baker has always been kind of that gunslinger mentality. He's just ugly, been so, yeah, he's, <laughs> yeah, he's just been so bad that, I have kind of cooled my exposure to him, but not in that range though. Like guys who can have true spike weeks, you know, he's there. Cause like I, you, there's so much competition I and mean, we can, we can touch on the 49ers QB situation as well. Cause that's been in the news a lot, but um, I, I don't know. That. Evans. Yeah. The age stuff is there too. He, he is an older player, but I, I don't mind it. Like he's someone I'm definitely not going to full fade, um, but he is someone I'm, I'm definitely not like gonna have too too much of it as we move forward. I think with Evans that we have to worry about it's like his receptions will always be low, <laughs> which is you know plentiful in half PPR. But like the guy does not like a, a 99 reception type guy. You know he's not like Michael Pittman that just catches everything. Um, but like he's the type of guy that's like if he gets 70 receptions, it's basically a thousand yards. And then that's where Evans has lived his entire career. Even and I even I wrote about this. He's played with Mike Glenn and he's played with. Jameis Winston, who has at this point shown to not really be that good. He's playing on fire. Oh, yeah, he's, he's, he's not good at all. All sorts of guys. And we kind of forget that because he's had Tom Brady the last few years. But, but so that's one point, though, like I feel like you could say in his favor is like Tom wasn't yeah. great last year, you know, like Tom Brady was not. He, he, he wasn't. Was and so he and, and Mike still had a thousand yards. And so I think that's one of, you know, the more bull cases for him is that Brady just wasn't that good last year and he still had a good season. Um, a lot know. of it, I mean, at the last game of the year, but they were just out of sync. Yeah, I, I mean. I think Tom Brady played well overall. They were, they were just out of sync. It didn't I, I think, yeah, the offensive line was pro- a lot bigger issue than um, his overall play. Now, I mean, he did play a lot more conservative um, for sure, but I think the arm was still there for Brady. It was just – the the you know the mental side with the line and not want to get hit and stuff but i mean evans dropped the pass a few times and he was just like i said it just wasn't a great year but the one thing i would point out is like he, you know brady would still through to him he did not give it he didn't quite care we're having a down year well your buddy i'm throwing to you still yeah. right because he was still getting open he was still beating coverages so i i think that's a little exaggerated of, of what it is for evans and i get it i'm not I, I hate Baker Mayfield as a fantasy quarterback. I don't take him at all. Yeah. But I don't think that you can dodge Evans completely. Um, Coming back to, around here, I, we've got a couple – still got some receivers that I like taking shots on that we'll probably be able to get a couple oh, of. Damn it. I wanted Dotson. Uh, <laughs> because Dotson, Dotson boy. I kind of want a Gabe because I feel like this team needs some major spike week games now You know that we're going to be – we're gonna need needing some more wide receivers. Brandon um, Cooks, man, we used to be able to get him at a hundred. Remember, I told you about those times you could have drafted Brandon Cooks. Oh, I, I that is one thing I miss. I I don't have much Brandon Cooks. Um, but at this point, it's like what you know is. I'm just gotta hope that you know Gallup plays better than him, and I want a Pickens. Yeah, I know some people are not as high on Pickens. Um, I am, but it's more of one of my. You know, a few player takes that I have, but I, I get the the bear case for him. I mean, Pickett could just be bad. Um, we'll see. We're kind of in a weird situation right now where we don't get a lot of deep guys. I mean, we can we can get I Sutton think, here. We can get Addison here. We can. You, what do you think about Quentin Johnson? Back. See, I in my game theory side, this team needs some upside. And I'd rather get Zay Flowers because Zay Flowers is more of a burner yak guy than than Quentin is. Yeah, but I think if any one of them, well, we'll just take Sutton first. We could, you could take him. Let's take, let's take Johnson. Let's take Sutton. I think that's probably the right play here if we're gonna go for like big I body. I don't mind taking guys. Zay. Um, I, I like Zay a lot. I'm fine. I'm fine with doing that. Okay, I guess I. We've got a couple. 
of those types. Yeah, we'll get on. I didn't see a lot from people the way they talk about Quentin. It's, you know, they say he's pretty inconsistent. And like, get and to if kill I had Harry to make a tiebreaker, I always lean on Steve Smith. And Steve Smith was just like, had all the love for Zay Flowers. He thinks he's the best receiver and one of the best receivers in his class that he's going to be instantaneous. Um, yeah, big play so. is Quentin. Yeah, Quentin, he is a big play guy. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I do like that a lot, guy, though. From what I've seen. I think he's pretty athletic. He's pretty fast. I I think yeah. he can – yeah. But I think I mean, they're Zay's all also similar. Too. Yeah, Zay's tiny. I mean – Yeah, they're both risky plays. Um, but that's what we need at this point is some upside from, from that position. I think we've recovered pretty good from going so heavy our RB early. Um, I mean, we can still drag it off. It's, it's like, it's like we talked fast. about with Sam is – Roster allocation, and when you start with three early RBs like this, you got to kind of pile on the receivers to a certain point. You know, you don't want to – we're not taking 10 wide receivers here, but – I mean, also on top of it, too, it's like we've drafted yeah, we so much that we kind of know what's available towards the middle and the end. So there are going to be options down that road. Yeah. And a tight end, I mean, we can take three late tight ends. We'd be totally fine at that position. I do want to kind of look – um, the one thing about our receiving core is I don't love our stacking options. We don't really have any at this point. Russ, I guess we could take. Um, and I mean, there's some quarterbacks we could take and then stack later with, but Russ is pretty far down. Yeah, um, Russ is later. We can always make up a tight ends here. Yeah. Um, I mean, we have enough rookies. Like we have Zay. Zay can end up on like literally any team. There's a lot of teams that are looking for a receiver right now. I mean, we saw this mid agency this year with all the really mid level receivers coming out. Um, so that was tough. Um, but I think, you know, one thing I did want to talk a little bit about uh, when we talked with Sam is just like how our points allocated, why, why we allocate a certain way. And I've said it on other previous streams. That's like, I love our flex being certain players. You know, we talked to a right receiver, running back, and I broke it down. Like at the end of the day, some of your flexes most of the time are going to be 10 point guys. They're going to be 10 to 15 point guys. 15, great. It's 10 to 12 because that's your minimal contribution points. You get anything under 10 in your contributions, like you just lost that week. So it doesn't really matter. So 10 to 12. And I think this is why we like the running backs. This is why I like certain receivers. Like I'm buying 12 points at flex. And if I if my flex is 12, that means my RB1, my RB2, my wide receiver one through three is above that. That's that's how that math would work. Um, so I'm glad, I'm glad we got that chart up there. That was my interpretation for that portion, and this is kind of why I draft certain teams or why I like certain teams the way we're drafting them. Right. Although I saw your last stream, and you know I enjoy your trail Lance on that one. So <laughs> I know feel a lot worse about that now. Yeah. So let's get into that a little bit. Um, the comments this week uh, from from Lynch and Shanahan. Yeah. It doesn't seem great. I know some people that are still want to believe in the trail Lance that, and I agree. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's been. A, a rough start to a career like it's, it's, it's super year. i know it's super unfortunate and then he wasn't even an experienced college player that's kind of my main concern is i get like the people who say you got to give him a chance because you haven't even been able to you know see what he can do and develop him but oh, at this point <laughs> um just the minimal amount of football he's played even dating back to college being a one-year player playing that and really in his last year they played like one exhibition game and that was it because it was COVID. And so really he played his junior year, I believe, and played that one game and then hasn't really played in, in, in his NFL career. And so there's just so much development time he's missed besides not been given a chance. And so I get from the 49ers perspective, like you have this insane roster, like, you can't waste it on developing a, a quarterback. And now they gave up three first round picks for them. So, I mean, that's, you know, obviously you've got to try, but I don't know. I don't. I don't feel great at all about Trey Lance. No, and I think it's weird that he's getting taken at quarterback fourteen. Um, all right, let's figure out picks here. I I still want to dig a little deeper for these type of guys. Um, I would I'd be honest, okay with grabbing like Rashad Penny here. We might yeah. be able to make this like a minimal for RB for fourteen. Yeah, um, we can do that. I'm fine taking Penny, and then I probably I still like this little range of receivers. Yeah. Um, you think you're okay with like KJ or Lazar or even Jacoby? I mean, we know what Jimmy G does. He throws it 
short, <laughs> right? And and all the inside and outside. But he does, and I, and I saw someone was talking about potential Renfro getting moved as well, right. and that would help a lot. Um, uh, I also I do I kind of like DVJ as well because I think he's going to be out there on every even with route. Elijah Moore that team. Yeah, I think Elijah can play the slot. They play different well, positions. Okay, I mean, Najoke is. I mean, he'll be the tight end. So I think let's let's go let's go DPJ. We need some okay. some big play upside in our receiver. Yeah, I think it's going to be Cooper and DPJ on the outside, and then more in the slot with Njoku at tight end. I mean, I think I think they're going to pass a lot a lot more than we are thinking they are, given the history of Cleveland lately with with Nick Chubb. So I, Chris, how are you? I'm not against that pick. I do think that Njoku. I think. P DPJ is a little overdrafted right now. Um, give it a take that I kind of know. Tenth round is pretty expensive for for what a guy that will, he's done. You know yeah. his production level. I it's like definitely to it's a bet on upside for sure. sure. And yeah. I mean Deshaun was terrible last year, so who knows there? But I just think given you know what our receiver core looks like, we do need some of those big spike week guys um, or chances of big spike week guys. All right, we got. I'll never Seriously. give up on Deshaun and Will Fuller and trying to recreate that God. with someone um, else. So yeah, to go back to your Trey Lance point with Purdy, I think I think this is why I I, I why I don't like Trey Lance as a draft pick. It's just because he's quarterback 14, right? You're you're we we like to play for upside, um, but the guy hasn't done it. He's basically still on his rookie year. When you really think about it, as you pointed out, like he really hasn't played. He's gonna have to learn how to play a different way due to his injury, and yeah. it's like so he's basically taking another rookie at quarterback fourteen. And here's it: it's like so Trey Lance got taken right here by Tommy Tuzones, but Jared Goff, Aaron Rodgers got drafted later. Like, you know, we still have Derek Carr, we still have you know, just other guys out there, and I just couldn't see it. I think that's one of the weirdest picks to me. I know that Liam has come out and said that he's you know he just feels like he might be delusional. He still thinks he's the guy, but. Yeah, I saw, I saw that, and I, the reason I wouldn't take him at all right now, though, is because I I think he is going to keep falling, and so maybe if he falls down the board to where you can get him at like an insane value, if he falls all the way down here to where like the rookies are going, and he, like you said, it's kind of like you're taking a, a shot on a rookie quarterback. I, okay. I would be more in this range if he gets down here of like this is an upside shot, you know. Yeah, that's what he should be. Like, kind of like Jordan Love. I mean. It, unknowns right no. and so if he gets down here i'll definitely be, get back in on him um he should have been there from the get-go honestly and like i said i'm still surprised he's as high as he was coming into the season um especially I, once we figured out how important like consistent quarterback play was and, and i'm of two minds of it as well because you know some people believe oh they're trying to motivate him but i get that but at the same time like wh like why come out and say that no if you're trying to motivate yes but on the other hand, it's like, why why even say that? Like, why put that on Trey Lance? Like, I would want to build someone up and give them confidence going into the offseason, not immediately tell them, yeah, we would rather play the other guy. Like, yeah. it just feels so unnecessary to come out and say that. Like, was any, if you could have easily just been like, you know what, they're all going to compete. Like, give the coach speak. I feel like that was such an easier thing to do. And the fact they didn't and went ahead and gave Purdy that vote of confidence just says – says so much to me um i mean and to top it off pretty has the locker room like yeah, kittle, kittle out there yeah, kittle. is his biggest fan you know no yeah. one loves pretty like kittle does you know like so uh, you gave him the locker room you gave him the coach you know you gave him the media like trade lance is just in the gutter and i know that and this this didn't work for zach wilson last year when people were just you know doubting him like we're kind of motivated it made him worse like yeah. And Zach Wilson technically was more proven than Trey Lance. My favorite tweet I saw this week I was like uh, when Sala came out and said, uh, Zach's our number two quarterback. And then someone quote tweeted and I was like, he's their number two and he's their only guy technically on the roster. <laughs> <laughs> that's terrible. I didn't see that. I got it. Yeah, oh, God. That's so I'll good. I'll send it to you later. It's like, yeah. That's so good. He's already saying he's their number two and he's technically the only quarterback on the roster. Um, I thought that was hilarious. But, all Chris right, G, Chris G's we're, comment is Will Fuller's coming back. Yeah, uh, we're Martin yelling Will Fuller, I'm sure. Something um, in the Miami water messed up his hand. I'm sorry, Chris G. I'm sorry, man. He was such a fun player. Um, 
Weird. Dude, I fell for him one time, and it was like the worst time to take him. <laughs> I took him the year he was a dolphin. And then I was like, oh, you know, he's going so late. He's going to be my guy. Sorry. Oops. And then it went um, out the window. We'll answer oh, this from Fancy Football what? Garage here in a minute. But let's – um. Oh, she took our Russ Wilson. I was wondering. I was kind of like, where's our stack? Do we have any stacking partners? I'm not seeing any. Um, we do need a QB. Uh, you know who my guy's going to be at this point. I like. I don't mind Carr because we can. Um, yeah, we have to kind of thing. Like we don't want. We don't have place. to. I feel like. Are we going to push it Richardson? Down. No. Um, <laughs> I think Carr's not like, underrated. By the way, I actually don't mind Kyler either. Um. Who else do you like here? Like the other, so she, he, we can kind of push. If someone takes Juwan, it's not the end of the world. That's fine. Um, um, I mean, we can grab Knox and Knox or Cole Komet. I still think those guys are the guys I want for tight end on top of it. I like Knox because he's going to be in the Bills offense and we know he's yep. a touchdown guy. I'm I mean, fine with that. I also wouldn't have mind, minded Mooney or Zay there. Um, so I think, I do think this has got to be an, at least an eight wide receiver team just with the, uh, Guys this is have. usually a receiver team. Yeah. Um, even nine with the extra pick we have here. So let's um, answer we, this note that we've picked. At the six, seven turn, Miles Sanders, DeAndre Swift, or J.K. Dobbins. And I, my order is I actually agree with Chris here. Um, whoops. DeAndre Carter and Ravens. <laughs> oh, um, yes. oh, that's I'm yeah, exactly Dobbins, right. Dobbins, Dobbins, Sanders, Swift. Um, and oh. Swift is it's similar to the, to the um, Trey Lance stuff of like, I feel like they've told us what they think about him. Um, Dobbins, a second year back from injury. I'm excited about that. Looks and then Miles Sanders at the year. moment, I think we'll get, you know, with a rookie QB, they're going to want to run the ball. So I I like Miles Sanders if so, I was ranking it that way. If we pull those three names up, I, I always ask myself, it's who gets the high value touches, right? And this is something I learned from ETR. I learned from LS Dreams. It's like, who are the high value touches going to go to? And I cannot think anyone's going to sit there and say, well, Swift is going to have more red zone. They both had 100 touches, 100 attempts at a red zone. Like, do we think that Swift would get the majority on his team? Right? right. I think Sanders would, and I think Dobbins would, but there's no way I think Swift gets, you know, even 30% of the goal line touches on this team. No. And if he does, it's, you know, 30 out of is not good. So that's why I'm quarterbacks go. Um, I'm kind of feeling a not better about Kyler's situation, but as he, I feel like he's fallen a little bit more, a couple of rounds where I feel like he, at you know he was up here with these guys and he's kind of gone down a tier. I'm more interested in taking him right now, um, just because I mean his upside compared to well, I mean we don't know with Anthony Richardson, but to these other guys on this round, like Kyler Murray could absolutely smash. Like if he even if he only plays like the last eight weeks of the year. If you do like three quarterbacks, I, I'm I'm liking Kyler Murray more now um, with a couple round fall. Um, I would take Kyler in a five dollar matchup. I wouldn't take him in a ten or a twenty five um, because it's just it's, there's no advantageous to it. Like, I mean, three teams will progress out of big board, but when BBM comes up, I I just don't see myself taking him. And if he and there's only certain builds I consider it. Like, I would take him. In this baby as a four quarterback build, I just I feel I just can't. Kyler is just never you're fine with three in a three QB build. Um, I mean, if you can't get get him through with three QBs, like I think that's totally valuable. I'm not taking four QBs ever, pretty much. Um, I think in twenty rounds, I think there's affordability for it, especially with how ugly after QB twenty really is, right? Yeah, um, and I think how far you're pushing it. I think if you're your first quarterback is like, let's say, like, is Kyle or Derek like in our situation, or like a little bit after him? Then I think you have to go for a quarterback because there just isn't that many guys out there. But if I your think, first quarterback's like Tua or or Kirk or Dak, then no, you're not doing that. I've act, I've taken Jacoby a couple times as well. Yeah. Um, I've taken a high of Jacoby. That's a three QB. Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've done that. I'm not doing more than three. I think if we would have double tapped. Car Kyler and then like added a Mac. I think that's fine. Well, that's um, fair. I think I forget that Mac exists so late. Yeah, Mac goes so Kyler late. I mean, so hard to love though. I mean, it's it's tough with the uncertainty, but his upside compared to like this this range is I don't know. I mean, like, his upside is his feet and his legs. And I mean, I know he's he, coming off an ACL, but like you're hoping that, in in my opinion, and like the theory behind it is, you drag him to week seventeen. He's at his peak health. 
and all of a sudden you've got a unique Kyler Murray. I, I guarantee you he's not going to be peak health weight week 17. I guarantee I mean, it. He got you know, injured like, so late this this last year. I was in the Patriots and he's going to have to recover. Um, and he's a small guy. Like this guy's played. This guy's been injured every year. I don't know. I think game theory wise, it's a good, it's a good bet. But I'm not, I'm not saying I have a lot of him. But Chris does though. Yeah. Wait, is are you saying Purdy at pick 200 is is Kyler your most exposed or Purdy? I don't know. I I think betting on him to be ready, like I don't know. We've seen it. Yeah, we took him in this draft. I haven't noticed it too much. Um. People are pretty sour. Like that much later. People um, are sour on Elijah Moore. They are. So, I don't know. Oh, Purdy's your highest. I think that's pretty smart. Yeah. See, Chris, she said Purdy. I think Purdy's fine. I think taking him makes sense. That dude was amazing, and he and he's he moves on his feet really well. Like I said Kyler just has been a toss up. I think the argument oh, is fair if he slips further though. We got sniped on Shahid and Juwan Johnson. I hate. Uh, I we could take Zay. Me. I think this is actually fun. Oh, we could take yeah. Zay I mean, he fell thirty picks past ADP. Yeah. We could take Zay. I I, I want to do downs. He's been getting a little bit more buzz lately. I know uh, you know MVS is down here. I like Gallup, MVS, I like Pierce, but I think let's take downs. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that pick. Yeah, let's take downs. I have nothing against it. We know what kind of player he is, right? He's not one of those like upside guys. It's fine. No, I think that's a pretty solid room. Got a couple rookie shots, some deep ball shots here, some more consistency with Ridley, which we don't have. Jacks, I don't know. It, not getting a car stack is like pain to me because he's the type of quarterback where like he he doesn't have the rushing, and so if he goes off, his pass catchers are gonna go off, and so that. Yeah. That is tough on this team. But here's a there's a thing with Carr. Even in his worst situation, his last three years, he's had seven contribution games or better, and some of them were twenty three to twenty eight point games, and then twenty, and then it's six and five. So in the last three years, he's contributed nineteen or more points per in, per season, five or more times. With the worst being last year, where he didn't play seventeen games. Look at this. Run. I think he's someone's on pace for at least six usable games, like very solid usable games, and then a lot of like mid. He had a lot of mid games, but six 19 points or more games. That's totally fine. And his weapons are pretty good. Like, I don't hate his weapons. I think, you know. Oh, I think his weapons are great. It's just the point of if Carr scores 35, which you or 30, which he's not going to do often. Yeah. John went, yeah, John went one pick in front of us. Like, if Carr is going to. If Carr's gonna score thirty, like he's gonna have a pass catcher or two, probably two minimum, that have really good weeks, and so he's just like that. You know, it's without the rushing, like I almost you have to stack these guys. I mean, well, it's no, for Carr, we, we would have. No, yeah. I mean, look, Shahid went three picks in front of us, and Jawan I mean, right in front yeah. of us. So I mean, it's just Thomas, it's, unfor it's unfortunate. I, like I would have pushed for double tapping that if they got back to us. Um, yeah, that's fair. No, I mean it's it's more of just a snipe, but I just why I think it's. It's I, tough I think to, the to stacks yeah. is fine for Derek. I think stacks for a lot of the passing quarterbacks make a ton of sense. I just think the rushing – it's always been the rushing guys that I think the stacking is very whatever. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I would have definitely taken them. We just didn't have an option. I know. This is what's, it's tough. Us, That's why I feel like I always um, – <laughs> I always tend to take my quarterback after – or, you know, like my pass catcher to a no, like I just ensure it. But we didn't really have great options because some of the guys we have – I mean, we could take. We honestly might have to end up taking Baker on the. I scene. mean, would you have felt better taking like Trevor Lawrence over Mike Evans? I don't think so, right? No, probably not. That's what it comes. No, to. I think Trevor's prices is, um, is pretty insane. It, I mean, I'm excited about the Jags, thinking. though. I mean, now I mean the fact we have two Jags now, maybe. And I don't yeah. know. You, you could do the one v ones if, like, if we took a receiver where we took Carr, and then we took a. Um, Lawrence, where we took Evans, I might like that two v two, with the context of us having two Jags. But I also didn't think Zay Jones would fall thirty three picks either. So like, yeah, no, I, I'm fine, totally fine grabbing yeah. him. I mean, Josh Allen's was twenty picks after ADP. So yeah, so we're it's a solid team. It's just tough that you know any big game car is going to have. Like I said, oh my god, past, um, we get what quarterbacks left on board? Oh, uh, Jimmy and Mac. Jimmy Mac, Sam Howell. I mean. Yeah. Sam Baker, How or maybe. I kind of like Brissett, honestly. I mean, they paid him. I saw one thing that said, like, they paid him $10 million. I think um, they paid him eight. I think it was, was 10. 
Oh, okay. Well, either way, they paid him a lot of money. Like, it almost feels like they're bringing him they in. They paid to him the same amount they paid to got paid and so on and so forth. It wasn't that much. James Winston got paid. <laughs> hey, we're um, unique. We got that, that naked car stack that you need in week 17. <laughs> well, actually, I car is going to have out. two QB sneaks from the one yard line and a dump down to the fullback. And then we're going to get the 30 point game with none of his pass catchers getting there. You just got to get drafted like you're right. Yeah. So. I guess I'd like taking. I guess this is what I meant by four quarterbacks. Like I would take Hal and, J- and Jacoby because we have pick nineteen twenty. Like it really doesn't cost us anything. Um, I feel like that's why I go four quarterback because I end up with those kind of guys sometimes. Like oh, I just got to grab Hal and Brissett. And either way, I get something out of the Commanders. I mean, it was not the greatest, but it's something I like to do. Or even I take like Winston on top of Carr. Yeah, I- I'm fine Wait. with doing something like that. Um. I'm rooting I like for that Sam comment. Donald, I think that would be hilarious. Like all the the Trey Lance truthers, which I was one of, but now now I'm not. Um, <laughs> that would be hilarious if it, if they started Darnold week one. Um, I mean, the fact that like they have Darnold on the team is kind of funny. Like they have Darnold, Purdy, and now Lance, right? Yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> So I know what I would like to take here. I don't know, though, if we're going to allocate that much to that position. Um, yeah. I was going to say Taekwon and Mac, but that would be our ninth wide receiver, which – That's excessive. Uh, I, I mean, mean, it I'd is, just, but – I'd rather just get Mac flat and maybe grab like – I mean, we could still do Hunter Henry, I think. Is yeah, he floating around? Or even – yeah. I don't – yeah, Hunter Henry's way down here. Like, I know we brought Gasecki in, mm-hmm. but – yeah, I would take I would take Hunter. I'm I'm totally fine with him. I mean, I think we'll push it though. Like if someone wants to snipe us on that, they can they can have him. Um I mean we gotta figure out what quarterbacks are left on board, right? This is a likely a three QB team, right? We have to assume. Um yes. So let's do Mac. You wanna just do Mac and Jimmy? I mean we at we least know Jimmy's Mac, gonna yeah. Jimmy's gonna start. It's gross. I just think Jamie's upside is like so bad. Like the guy had like yeah, very uh, almost like our whole QB room. Like that's it's tough. But I would rather like I would rather have had Mac and then grab Brissett and Hal over Jimmy. I don't know. Jimmy just has such good weapons that he could get elevated. I feel like I mean Washington's weapons aren't terrible either. The weapons um, are amazing over there. The I mean, yeah, Dotson and Curtis. McLaurin is good. Yeah, I mean, they have good receivers. They don't have Devontae Adams, though. That's fair. Their receiving core is good. That I, that was a miss. miss um, on my I love part. the receivers over there. I mean, I, I, I did too. It. Yeah, I wasn't thinking that. I was thinking um, just Devontae Adams, you know, like just overshadowing everything. But no, the, the commanders have great weapons. But like, so Jimmy G last year, well, I will say the one thing that changes is that I think that. They won't hand the ball off 50,000 times like they do in the Niner land, uh, 49ers. But, like, if you actually look at over Jimmy G's games, he only had one contribution game, two contribution games, one of them being a spike and one not. And he played almost the entire season. So it, it just throws me off with Jimmy G. But I do think they throw more this time around. I think they do. And I still, like, I mean, I don't do much of it. So if you want to convince me to do four QBs, and since we went so heavy at RB, we could stop with four. Nah, and do we're, like I a. I think we're fine. We're gonna go with these three. We're gonna go with these three. I think the minute we grab Jimmy G, we we threw out the fourth quarterback. Yeah, that, that is true. We, we need I mean, it. the only fourth quarterback I would grab is like maybe Winston, and that's it. I mean, I don't always mind one of, the, one of the Washington guys, or even Baker, since we have Evans. Yeah, maybe Baker or something. I, well, actually, I would rather we grab have the, un, Baker. the unstacked pocket passing QB room is. <laughs> it's, Yolo. It's irking me. <laughs> you know, I did not want this. Okay, I mean, we just the way we ended up at. If it was up to me, I would I would have gotten that stack. That would be fine. But people wanted to steal from us today. That's fair. That's fair. It's not, we could really control it. We could have not taken Carr. But other than that, that's But the then, then we would end up with, like, some weirder quarterback No, we could have had, like, Anthony Richardson and C.J. Stroud and stack those guys up late. Then we still would be unstacked. We'd have C.J. Stroud and no Panthers. Like, what are we going to do? There's Panthers you could take. You could take Ugh. Terrace Marshall. Yeah, C.J. Stroud Hurst. doesn't put up points, though. I don't care. Like, I don't think that guy's going to put up. Hayden Hurst. I think Derek Carr has at least, you know, five to six spike weeks in him or contributions. I, I mean, thirty three percent of my games he's going to be useful. I don't know if CJ Stroud gives you thirty three percent usage. <laughs> Stephanie had Judy, yeah, on our, our Denver snipe, but yeah, no, fair enough. Uh, no, you know what? There's your buddy James Robinson. You love James Robinson. 
No, I'm still zero shares. <laughs> we'll continue to be to be zero shares. You don't trust your Super Bowl winning coach, your Hall of Fame coach. You don't trust him. No, um, no, I do. But it is a tough comment if you're Bill to be like, you know, why? The, the reporter asked him, like, you know, why should Patriots fans be confident? And he said that the last 25 years, which is a, a cool response, but also like, if you don't ever turn it around, that can immediately backfire on you and be like. Yeah, because you had Brady, right? Like the last 25 years, that's why it was great. And so if yeah. you don't turn it around and, you know, create a winner again, then like everyone should be like, oh, I was always Brady, which. Oh, Chris has added some CD. Got two shares of him now. There you go. Zero Najee. <laughs> that's okay. I think CD is hard to draft. It really is. Like I, I said this like on my first one of my first streams. I was like, mm -hmm. someone I thought I would have more of, but I just never get to is like CD Lamb. Because it's like yeah. you don't want to grab him at like 107. No. You're hoping CD goes to like 111, 112, but he gets taken before 111, 112. It's like really weird taking him. Um yeah. Because you know, there's not upside like him versus like AJ Brown and and, and Tyreek Hill. You don't but I will say that CD has more catches likely to, than AJ Brown. So yeah, but unless they just run the run the ball so much, but I don't know. And and there's more competition now there with Cooks, so it's true. It is true. It's not the most fun <laughs> click, that's for sure. You know, I'm just gonna say when Najee comes around, just just so you understand, guys, I'm gonna come back and I'm, I'm gonna be like, hey, just throw it out there. You know, he was RB14. <laughs> like, you're not paying a ton for him. So. No. I'm just glad you're like semi on my side on this one. I I have some Najee. I do. I've got eight percent, eight nine percent of him. I'll take it. Um, I don't think well, I'm it's gonna, not fifty five, but I'll take it. I don't think I'm going to end up getting able to max this contest, but that's I had a good share. That's even higher percentage of um with the less drafts. I mean, all right. Let's see what we got left on board. We still need a tight end. We can still get some running backs. I mean, there's there's um, James Robinson. No. <laughs> he exists. I was um, we had Zach Evans. Um, I like Zach Evans here. I like Chase Brown. I like Drum Ford. I'm probably only taking one of these guys. I mean, Fan, I still like as just a late tight end who was going to be out there for the Seahawks, I feel like. Um, I would take Fant here as one of our picks. Okay. I've actually been taking more Fant. Um, I was a little sour on him just because he disappointed me last year, but his overall numbers weren't terrible. That guy's just always injured, though. That's my my biggest qualm with him. Um, um, but do you, which I running back do you like? I, I, I think, think we can grab Zach. I think Zach. Yeah, Evans I think we shot on one of these rookies. I mean, you know, you're talking about the chart with me, and I was like, you know, it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, the guy's decent. I mean, he was a huge, huge prospect coming out. So, I I have a lot of Chase Brown. You saying Chase Brown? I picked him a good bit. Um, yeah, what it. I think double tapping the rookies would have been fine because yeah. with our four guys, I think we can get a little bit like let's play for upside kind of situation because there's certain guys just there isn't upside for right like unless somebody dies. Um, yeah, you, can, you know you have to hope some of you guys can just move up for free. So I do think we have an interesting last pick here. I think we're done at RB with those five with the three early picks on them, um, and then also going penny. I think we have to decide ninth wide receiver or fourth QB because I think third tight end's a given. We're going to take a third tight end on the scene. Third tight end's a given. And then we uh, need to decide ninth wide receiver or tack on a fourth QB. Um, I would say third tight end for sure, obviously. And I don't think we're done at running back just because I, I think there's value at some of these guys. But we don't have to take them. I don't think we need I just We took so – I don't know. I mean, our receiving core is not, not great. I mean, um, if, certain, if certain receivers come back, like I'm definitely down for. I mean, it. and I know it. Like you know, Sam stuff did say like, there's small percentage points, but the the late wide receivers have just you know hit higher upsides more than some of these late RBs. True. I don't know. We allocated three of our first four picks to RB at the position. I know we, you know. I'm not trying to contradict everything we just talked about with Sam, um, but I just think it's more of like a roster allocation. Like we we. It, you know, have so much in these running backs. Even taking like Penny where we did, um, you know, ninth, tenth round, like oh, that's like eighth round. What, what was well, that? I, I don't think there's many running backs I would take. There's just one, and you already, you already know my boy is like the guy that I would probably consider because I just feel like he just walks into a position, 
and it's Gus. Like it's just Gus. Other than that, I think you can grab any of the other wide receivers. You could grab. I mean, Slayton's still Hunter, there. Slayton, like, Slayton's like Slayton can there. have like, even Slayton. Hardman. I, I don't Hardman. mind Hardman at this point. Yeah, all those guys definitely have more value. I think if they were gone and I was stuck with something random, then I think like <laughs> Chris yeah. says his team needs a, a fourth QB. I almost well, don't mind it. Like, I mean, who's the fourth? If Mac Jones. Say, well, Mac Levi, Jones is the is. best QB on our team. Car hate. slander. Um. There's a great wide receivers here. Like Corey Davis even can still put up. You know, that guy is always randomly useful. I mean, for me, whether they make, make it back or not, my pick would be Slayton here. Same. Um, I think and Henry, Hunter Henry and Slayton. Or we can Hardson. get Zach Wilson and Nicole Hardman. That's the stack that you've been waiting for all year. <laughs> but I don't <laughs> mind like taking I mean, if Levis goes first round, like he's gonna play this year. I don't yeah. like him at all. Um, playing and contributing are two different things. I just don't think they use it. Yeah, but I mean, look at our quarterback room. I mean, that's true. So Actually, our look, quarterbacks are pretty ugly. Our, so our quarterback's right. so ugly. Like, I, I think we should on this team do a fourth QB. Why, like, what team do you think he goes to? Who we don't have to do Levis. I mean, we could take um, Brissett. I think Levis or Brissett if they make it back. No, no, no. You're always you're always trying to shove Levis down my throat. So let's go. No, get I that. think Levis is terrible. Don't get me wrong. Like he, he I'm not a, a Levis stand by any means. It's just a rookie QB that's probably gonna go in the first round. You know, those guys just get on the field and like I mean, I don't think he's gonna be good, but I also as a prospect coming out of college, I thought Josh Allen was terrible. So <laughs> we could be yeah. proven wrong easily. Yeah, now Levis isn't the same runner by any means as Josh Allen. I'm mm -hmm. just like I I don't like writing people off anymore because we've seen so many people who are, you know, inaccurate or like bad college players end up good. Yeah, I think of like running quarterbacks always a different story. I feel like any running quarterback is like worth a buy just because they are runners. I'm always just more confused on guys. I don't. Not the case. I mean, who's left on the quarterback board? We have. Uh, to me, it's know. it's either it's Levis, and it's uh, Brissett. It's, uh, I mean, he takes him darn. No. Sammy D, so. baby. I mean, men. Um, I take Mike White as a handcuff every now and then. And people seem to like that for some reason. Yeah, I, I think it's yeah, Levis or Brissett would be the only quarterback. I'm really, Brissett, you know, like let's let's bank on money. We think that you know. Yeah, I mean, they how, gave him the contract. How at the end of the day, like people are you know pushing the how narrative. I mean, he's a fifth round pick. Like those guys sometimes do develop, and and they seem to like him there. All right, Levis goes anyway, so. That decision was made for us, and then Henry. Yeah, you think? Yeah, Henry is a very good tight end. I think he's better than Gasicki. This is a Dolphin man. I just think Gasicki is very limited. Yeah, and you know we're gonna want to run the ball in New England, and Henry is a better blocker than Gasicki. But it's just an interesting team. Not one of my favorite teams we've ever drafted. We our stacks kind of got sniped on us, you know, as we went through it, but. I mean, if you're going to take, you know, these type of court quarterbacks going four, I don't hate. I love our Arby's. We're going to crush it running back. Um, um, Grouch has a question. He says, do y'all think Tony Pollard goes in the second round at some point? I, mean, I think it's a very possible. I think it's yeah. I, I waiting for the draft to occur. I don't think he should. I, if I they just don't, don't draft. Yeah, I'm with draft. Chris here. If they don't draft a running back, he's going one, two turn. Yes, and I think that's a very strong possibility. I just don't think he's worth it if they don't draft a guy. Like I don't know, man. He's, so he's just hard to get a three down roll to. The dude couldn't survive it. No, and, and that does make me nervous. The coaches have literally said, you know, we don't think Tony can handle all the work, but he's so efficient and what he can do through the air. Um, if they don't bring anyone in, he's going first. So let's take a look at Steph's team, see what she did. She goes Kelsey, Garrett Wilson, Pollard. I like that. Judy, Jamison, Dobbins. She's got a lot of the guys we like. Dots. She took the Dots and Quentin. This is where all our good players went. We're on Stephanie's team. Akers, um, Goff, Wilson. Goff to go with Jamison. Russ to go it's with Judy. A single stacking. I like that. Mooney, Gainwell, Tim Patrick gets gets the double. Michael Gallup. Got Gallup. Sam Grab Howell. Sam Howell. Chase Brown and McBride. Some people. Irv. She's got the Irv Smith pick. She said that. Yeah, just to piss everybody off. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Irv just <laughs> I like that. Yeah, it's a good team. I like the team a lot. Yeah, we should trade. Yeah, let's <laughs> trade teams here. Um, but no, that was fun. 
what, one of our more uh, one of our more yeah 107 i've i've got about five slows going at the moment um i don't think i'm gonna end up maxing it just kind of doing them at you know a couple of day right now gonna be a lot more tournaments offered so don't want to rush you know too hard into it but obviously i've done a lot of entries so all right well we finished your 107th draft of the big board. Jay, just to throw, just throw out there, um, big board is closing soon, guys. So if you ha- are trying to get more drafts in, get it done. Get it done because we're at 94%. It's going to fill up. And we'll, we'll talk about some of that next week. Oh, sorry, next or Thursday. Thursday, this upcoming yeah. Thursday. The topic is like, you know, how do you prepare for your next draft? What do we do with the big board closing? You know, that's going to be our topic for next this upcoming Thursday. You know, like there's a lot to think about. And I like I said I did push out an article about my favorite values at each position up and coming to the big board. So something to look at if you're waiting. I'll tweet it out later. And continue to volume. You know, join us on Thursday. And we hopefully might be able to get one more big board in before this thing officially closes. Um, so I'm gonna ask you a last second question. Did you talk about the team? With this? I, I, we, I we did, did. I we did it. talked about it a little bit. Um, um I referenced it a little bit, and I and I, my theory is still by that the person got one twelve and was just livid. Um, I've heard of this before. People just hate being one twelve. They will ruin a draft to get money back. How true that is, I don't know. I was actually I not think it's in very drafts true. Actually, that returned back to me. Um, but you know, hope believes I'll get my money back. So, and I'll get my bullet back, which means I will bad. get one twelve next time. Yeah. So. Um, but yeah, no, everybody, thanks for hanging out. Drop a sub if you enjoyed it. We'll be back Thursday. Um, go subscribe to ADP Chasing if you're not already. I'm sure if you're watching this, you are subscribed to Ship Chasing and ADP Chasing. But yeah, thanks again to Sam for coming on. Really interesting stuff. Um, I get to feel smarter after every ADP Chasing I watch. So definitely go check that out. Um, yeah, thanks for thanks for hanging out with us. Like and subscribe. <laughs>